The night began like any other, with the humdrum routine of dinner and the kids' bedtime. But it quickly spiraled into chaos when my husband, Stephen, stumbled upon a message on my phone, his face twisted with anger as he read the incriminating text. His eyes, usually calm, blazed with fury. Without warning, he lunged at me, knocking the phone from my hand. The force of his shove sent me crashing into the coffee table. Pain radiated through my body, but before I could react, Stephen was on me, his fists flying. Each punch landed with a sickening thud, leaving me dazed and disoriented. I tried to shield myself, but he was relentless. The children, woken by the commotion, stood at the top of the stairs, their eyes wide with fear. Go back to your rooms. Stephen barked, his voice hoarse with rage. They hesitated for a moment before scurrying back to their rooms, their terrified faces seared into my memory. Stephen grabbed me by the hair, dragging me across the living room. I clawed at his hands, desperate to break free, but he was too strong. He slammed me against the wall, his face inches from mine. How long? He spat, his breath hot against my cheek. How long have you been cheating on me? I couldn't speak, the words trapped in my throat. My silence only fueled his anger. He hurled me to the ground, kicking me repeatedly until I could barely breathe. My vision blurred, and I felt myself slipping into unconsciousness. The last thing I remembered was the sound of sirens in the distance, and the front door bursting open as neighbors, alerted by the noise, called for help. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. The room was stark and sterile, the harsh fluorescent lights reflecting off the white walls. I tried to sit up, but a sharp pain in my ribs forced me to lie back down. A nurse appeared at my bedside, her expression sympathetic. You're safe now, she said softly, adjusting the four drip in my arm. The police are outside if you feel up to talking. I nodded weakly, my mind racing. Fear gnawed at me, but beneath it, a strange sense of anticipation stirred. Richard, my affair partner, would be coming to see me. We had talked about a future together, a life free from Stephen's control. Maybe now, that future was within reach. As if on cue, Richard entered the room. His face was a mix of concern and determination. He leaned in close, his voice low and urgent. I'll handle everything, he promised. When you get out of here, there will be a surprise waiting for you. Stephen won't be a problem anymore. I wanted to believe him, to trust that everything would be okay. But a nagging doubt lingered at the back of my mind. Could we really escape the nightmare that my life had become? As Richard squeezed my hand reassuringly, I pushed the doubt aside, clinging to the hope that things would finally change. The night had been a blur of violence and confusion, but now, lying in the cold, sterile hospital room, I allowed myself a flicker of hope. Perhaps this was the beginning of a new chapter, one where I could find peace and happiness. Only time would tell. The day after my husband's attack, I lay in the hospital, staring at the ceiling. The sterile smell of antiseptic filled the air. The door creaked open, and Richard, my affair partner, walked in, his expression a mix of concern and determination. He pulled a chair close to my bed, sitting down with a purposeful air. Are you okay? He asked, his voice steady despite the tension in his eyes. I nodded, wincing at the pain in my ribs. He glanced around the room, ensuring we were alone, then leaned in closer. His voice dropped to a whisper. Listen, when you get out of here, there will be a surprise gift waiting for you. I'll take care of your loser husband. I looked at him, searching his face for any sign of doubt, but his gaze was unwavering. His words were both chilling and comforting, filling me with a strange mix of fear and hope. The idea of a life without Stephen's control was intoxicating. But the reality of what Richard was proposing was daunting. Richard continued, outlining his plan. You need to act normal when you go home. Don't let on that anything is different. I'll handle the rest. He squeezed my hand, a gesture meant to reassure me. Trust me, this will all be over soon. The nurse entered with a tray of medication, interrupting our conversation. Richard stood up, giving me a final, meaningful look before stepping aside. I'll be back, he said, then slipped out of the room, leaving me alone with my thoughts. Later that day, the police came to take my statement. 
They asked about the events leading up to the attack, their questions methodical and probing. I told them what I could, carefully omitting any mention of Richard. My husband's anger, the violence, it all came pouring out, but the plan to remove him from my life remained my secret. Visitors came and went, each offering their own version of sympathy. A co-worker brought flowers, a neighbor dropped off a get-well card. They all had the same questions, and I gave them the same rehearsed answers. Each visit felt like a performance, a necessary charade to maintain the facade of normalcy. That evening, as the hospital quieted down, I received a text from Richard. Everything is set. Stay strong. The message was brief, but filled with promise. I stared at the screen, feeling a surge of anticipation. Richard's confidence was infectious, and I began to believe that this nightmare might finally end. A doctor came in to check on me. His routine questions a welcome distraction. He mentioned that I could be discharged soon. News that filled me with a mix of relief and apprehension. The prospect of returning home was daunting, but the thought of seeing Richard's plan come to fruition kept me going. As the night wore on, I replayed Richard's words in my head. His promise echoed in the quiet of the hospital room, a beacon of hope in my turbulent world. I clung to that promise, imagining a future where Stephen was no longer a threat. The next morning, as sunlight filtered through the blinds, I prepared for my discharge. The nurse helped me gather my things, her chatter a soothing background noise. With every step towards the exit, my resolve hardened. I was ready to face whatever came next, bolstered by Richard's assurance that soon, everything would change. Leaving the hospital, I felt a strange mix of fear and excitement. The future was uncertain, but for the first time in a long while, I dared to hope. Richard's promise was my lifeline, and I clung to it with everything I had. That night, as I lay in my hospital bed, I tried to find a comfortable position despite the dull ache in my ribs. The hum of machines and the distant murmur of nurses filled the room. I was drifting off when my phone buzzed on the bedside table. Groggily, I reached for it, expecting a message from Richard or a concerned friend. The screen lit up with a notification. It was a message from my husband, Stephen. My heart raced as I opened it. The text read, No one will ever find your lover. But so you don't miss him, I'll send you his penis as a gift. A wave of horror washed over me. I stared at the screen, unable to believe what I was reading. My mind raced. I knew Stephen was furious, but this was beyond anything I had imagined. Panic gripped me, making it hard to breathe. I read the message again, hoping I had misunderstood, but the words remained the same. I realized I needed to act quickly. I pressed the call button for the nurse, hoping to get some help. A nurse named Jenny entered the room, her smile fading when she saw my expression. What's wrong? She asked, her voice calm but concerned. I handed her the phone, unable to speak. She read the message, her face paling. We need to get the police involved, she said, her tone serious. This is a threat? The police arrived within minutes, led by Detective Harris. He introduced himself and asked me to recount everything. I told him about the attack, the affair, and the message. He took notes, his face a mask of professional concern. We'll trace this message and keep an eye on your husband, he assured me. In the meantime, stay here and try to rest. Detective Harris left to make some calls, and I lay back, trying to calm my racing thoughts. My phone buzzed again. This time, it was a message from Richard. Are you okay? Did you get my last text? I quickly typed back, explaining what had happened and asking if he was safe. His reply was immediate. I'm fine. Stay strong. We'll get through this. The night dragged on, each minute feeling like an hour. The hospital was eerily quiet, and every sound made me jump. I tried to distract myself by watching TV, but my mind kept drifting back to Stephen's threat. I couldn't shake the image of his twisted smile as he sent that message. Early in the morning, Detective Harris returned. We traced the message to a burner phone, he said. It's going to be hard to track, but we have a few leads. We've also put an alert out for your husband and your lover. We're doing everything we can. As the detective left, Richard texted again, updating me on his situation. He assured me he was taking precautions and staying hidden. His messages brought some comfort, but the fear lingered. Later that day, I was discharged from the hospital. 
The staff was sympathetic but distant, clearly unnerved by the police presence. I gathered my things and left, stepping into a world that felt suddenly hostile. Returning home, I found the house eerily silent. Stephen was gone, and there were no signs of the kids. The emptiness was overwhelming. I checked every room, but there was nothing to indicate where they had gone. Then, I found a small, blood-stained package on the kitchen counter. My heart pounded as I opened it, dread pooling in my stomach. Inside was a piece of paper with a single word, soon. The terror returned with full force, and I knew my ordeal was far from over. I was discharged the next morning, a nurse wheeling me out to the curb where a taxi waited. My heart pounded as we approached my home. The driver glanced at me in the rearview mirror, his curiosity evident. I thanked him absently, fumbling for my keys. My hands shook as I unlocked the front door. The door creaked open, revealing an eerie silence inside. I stepped into the foyer, calling out for Stephen and the kids. No answer. The living room was undisturbed, except for a few scattered toys and the remnants of last night's chaos. I moved through the house, my anxiety growing with each empty room. In the kitchen, dishes from last night's dinner still sat in the sink. A half-finished glass of wine on the counter suggested Stephen left in a hurry. I opened the refrigerator, finding it oddly empty. Moving to the bedrooms, I found my children's rooms tidy but vacant. Their beds were neatly made, as if no one had slept in them. My own bedroom told a different story. The closet doors were open, and Stephen's clothes were gone. Drawers were pulled out, their contents rifled through. It was clear he had packed hastily. I checked the bathroom finding his toiletries missing. Panic surged as I realized he had taken the kids and disappeared. Downstairs, I searched for any clues about where they might have gone. I rifled through papers on Stephen's desk, but found nothing out of the ordinary. The family computer showed no recent activity. Desperation set in as I realized there were no clues to follow. I picked up the phone to call the police but hesitated. The sound of a car pulling into the driveway made me freeze. I peeked through the curtains, recognizing the car as Richard's. He hurried to the door, his face tense with worry. Are you okay? He asked, stepping inside without waiting for an invitation. I nodded, pointing to the empty house around us. He looked around, taking in the desolation. Where are they? He asked, more to himself than to me. We searched together, Richard checking the garage and the backyard. The car was gone, and there were no signs of recent activity. He pulled out his phone, making a few calls, but each one ended with a frustrated sigh. A knock on the door interrupted our search. It was Mrs. Henderson, our nosy neighbor. She peered inside, her eyes wide with curiosity. I saw the police last night, she said. Is everything all right? I forced a smile, trying to appear calm. Just a misunderstanding, I lied. She nodded, her gaze lingering on Richard before she left. I closed the door, my nerves frayed from the encounter. Richard and I sat at the kitchen table, contemplating our next move. He suggested checking Stephen's usual haunts, places he might go with the kids. We split up, each taking a list of locations to visit. I checked the park, the kids' school, and even the local grocery store, but found no trace of them. Returning home empty-handed, I found Richard already there. He shook his head, indicating he had no luck either. We sat in silence, the weight of the situation pressing down on us. That evening, I called the police again, this time to report Stephen and the kids missing. The officer took my statement, promising to start an investigation. As night fell, I locked the doors, feeling more alone than ever. The house, once filled with laughter and life, now felt like a hollow, abandoned shell. The reality of my situation sank in, and I knew finding my family would not be easy. I staggered through the house, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. The air was thick with an ominous silence that only heightened my anxiety. I moved from room to room, checking for any signs of my family. Everything was in its place, yet the emptiness was palpable. Entering the kitchen, I noticed something on the counter. A small, blood-stained package sat there, stark against the clean surface. My heart pounded in my chest as I approached it. I reached out with trembling hands, hesitating before finally peeling back the paper. What I saw made my knees buckle, and I collapsed to the floor. 
Inside the package was a grotesque, severed body part, a clear sign that my affair partner, Richard, had been brutally murdered. The gruesome sight confirmed my worst fears. My husband had carried out his sinister promise. The realization hit me like a tidal wave, overwhelming my senses. For a moment, I couldn't move. I just sat there, staring at the horrific evidence of Stephen's rage. The room spun, and I struggled to catch my breath. I forced myself to get up, knowing I needed to act quickly. I grabbed my phone and dialed Detective Harris my hands shaking so badly I could barely press the buttons. The detective answered on the second ring. I explained the situation in a rush, my voice trembling with panic. There's a package, I stammered. Bloodstained. It's in the kitchen. I think. I think Stephen killed Richard. Harris assured me that officers were on their way. I hung up and backed away from the counter, unable to look at the package any longer. I sank into a chair, my mind racing. Questions flooded my thoughts. How could Stephen have done this? Where were my children? What was going to happen next? Minutes later, the police arrived, their presence both a relief and a stark reminder of the gravity of the situation. They moved quickly, securing the house and examining the package. Detective Harris pulled me aside, asking for details. I recounted the events as best I could, my voice shaking. The officers took the package as evidence, handling it with care. Harris informed me that they would do everything possible to find Stephen and ensure my safety. His words were meant to be comforting, but the fear in my heart remained. As the police continued their investigation, I sat in the living room, numb and exhausted. The reality of Richard's death and my husband's brutality was almost too much to bear. I knew that life as I knew it was over, and the road ahead would be filled with uncertainty and danger. The night dragged on each minute feeling like an eternity. I stayed in the living room, unable to sleep, my thoughts consumed by the horrific discovery and the desperate hope that my children were safe somewhere. The silence of the house, once a comfort, now felt like a suffocating reminder of the nightmare I was living. As the police continued their investigation, I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder. Mrs. Henderson, our nosy neighbor, seemed to be watching my every move. She appeared at her window whenever the police came by, her eyes narrowed with suspicion. One afternoon, I stepped outside to get some fresh air. Mrs. Henderson was in her garden, pretending to tend to her roses. She glanced up, her eyes meeting mine. I've noticed a lot of commotion at your house lately, she said, her tone innocent but her gaze piercing. Is everything all right? I forced a smile. Just a misunderstanding. The police are handling it, I replied hoping to end the conversation quickly. But Mrs. Henderson wasn't satisfied with my vague answer. You know, I've seen some strange things going on around here, she continued, lowering her voice. That night, there was a car I didn't recognize parked outside your house. And the next morning, your husband and kids were gone. Her words sent a chill down my spine. How much did she know? I tried to keep my expression neutral. Thanks for letting me know, I said, turning to head back inside but she wasn't done. If you need any help, don't hesitate to ask. She called after me, her voice dripping with false concern. I'm always here if you need someone to talk to. I nodded and went back into the house, closing the door behind me. Mrs. Henderson's words echoed in my mind. Could she be involved in some way? Or was she just a meddlesome neighbor? Her curiosity was unsettling, and I couldn't shake the feeling that she knew more than she was letting on. Over the next few days, I noticed Mrs. Henderson's prying eyes following me everywhere. When I checked the mail, she was there. When I took out the trash, she appeared. Her constant presence added to my growing paranoia. One evening, as I was closing the curtains, I saw her standing at her window, staring directly at me. I quickly pulled the curtains shut, my heart racing. The more she watched, the more I questioned her intentions. Was she a friend trying to help, or was she a foe with her own agenda? Detective Harris came by again to update me on the investigation. I mentioned Mrs. Henderson's behavior, hoping he could offer some insight. He listened carefully, his expression thoughtful. We'll look into it, he promised. In the meantime, try to stay calm and keep an eye out for anything unusual. As the days passed, my paranoia grew. Every creak of the house, every shadow outside the window, made me jump. 
I couldn't trust anyone, not even the people closest to me. The uncertainty and fear were overwhelming, and Mrs. Henderson's probing eyes only made things worse. One night, I heard a noise outside and peered through the curtains. Mrs. Henderson was there again, this time with a flashlight, inspecting something on my lawn. I watched her for a moment, then decided to confront her. I stepped outside, my heart pounding. What are you doing? I demanded. She looked up, startled, then quickly composed herself. Just checking on things, she said smoothly. You never know what might happen around here. Her response did little to ease my mind. As I returned to the house, I realized that until I knew her true intentions, I couldn't let my guard down. The line between friend and foe had never been blurrier. The days that followed were a blur of fear and suspicion. My phone buzzed constantly with anonymous, threatening messages. Each one was more menacing than the last, escalating my paranoia. You'll pay for what you've done, read one. You can't hide forever, warned another. One evening, while I was trying to relax in the living room, my phone buzzed again. This time, the message was different. I'm closer than you think. My heart raced as I looked around, feeling the walls closing in. Every creak and rustle in the house made me jump. I called Detective Harris, my voice shaking. The messages are getting worse, I told him. He assured me that they were working on tracing the numbers, but the reassurance did little to calm my nerves. I decided to change my routine, hoping to throw off whoever was watching me. I started taking different routes to the grocery store, parking my car in different spots, and varying my schedule. But no matter what I did, the messages kept coming. One afternoon, I was walking back from the store when I felt someone watching me. I glanced around but saw nothing out of the ordinary. The feeling of being followed persisted, making my skin crawl. I hurried home, double-checking the locks on all the doors and windows. That night, as I tried to sleep, my phone buzzed again. This time, the message was accompanied by a photo of my house taken from the outside. I bolted upright, my heart pounding in my chest. Someone was close, too close. I called the police again, barely able to speak. An officer arrived within minutes, searching the perimeter of my house. They found nothing, but the unease lingered. I knew someone was out there, watching my every move. In a desperate attempt to find some semblance of normalcy, I invited a friend over for coffee. We sat in the kitchen, chatting about mundane things, but my mind was elsewhere. My phone buzzed again. I discreetly checked it, finding another anonymous message. Enjoy your coffee. It might be your last. I showed the message to my friend, who urged me to go to the police station. We drove there together, my paranoia reaching new heights. At the station, Detective Harris took my statement and promised increased patrols around my house. Returning home, I found the silence even more oppressive. I kept my phone close, expecting another message at any moment. The anonymous threats had turned my life into a waking nightmare, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible was about to happen. As the days passed, I became hypervigilant, jumping at every sound and shadow. Each buzz of my phone sent a jolt of fear through me. The messages showed no signs of stopping, each one a cruel reminder that I was never truly alone. One evening, I received a message that made my blood run cold. Time's almost up. I knew then that whoever was behind these threats was planning something. The dread coiled in my stomach, knowing that the situation was about to reach a terrifying climax. The police arrived early in the morning, their presence immediate and overwhelming. Detective Harris led the team, his expression serious. They spread out, combing through every room in the house, searching for any clues about the disappearance of my husband, kids, and Richard. The questioning began in the living room. Harris sat across from me, his notepad ready. Tell us everything from the beginning, he said. I recounted the events, carefully choosing my words, aware that every lie I told felt like a ticking time bomb. Your husband and children, when did you last see them? Harris pressed. I hesitated, then replied, the night before I was attacked. Stephen was furious about something, and then they were gone. Harris scribbled notes, his eyes never leaving my face. What about your affair partner? When did you last have contact with him? The mention of Richard made my heart race. I forced myself to stay calm. He visited me in the hospital, I answered. We planned to meet, 
but I haven't heard from him since. Outside, officers searched the yard, checking every corner for any sign of foul play. One of them found the package I had hidden in the garage. Harris was immediately informed, and the grisly contents were examined. What is this? he demanded, showing me the blood-stained remnants. I struggled to find an explanation. I don't know. I lied, my voice trembling. I found it after Stephen and the kids disappeared. I thought it might be related, but I was too scared to report it. Harris's gaze hardened. This is crucial evidence. You should have informed us immediately. I nodded, pretending to be remorseful, knowing the lie was fragile. Hours passed as the police continued their investigation. They took my phone, analyzing the threatening messages and trying to trace their origin. The house was filled with a tense silence, broken only by the occasional murmur of officers exchanging information. The questions kept coming, relentless and probing. Did Stephen have any enemies? Anyone who might want to harm him? Harris asked. I shook my head. Not that I know of. He was always careful, never got into trouble. Another officer entered with a bag of items taken from Stephen's office. We found these in his drawer, he said handing over a collection of documents. Harris examined them, his brow furrowing. These are legal papers, bank statements. It looks like he was planning something. The pressure mounted with each passing minute. My lies felt like a web tightening around me. Why didn't you come forward sooner about your affair? Harris asked bluntly. I swallowed hard. I was scared. I thought it would make things worse. As the day wore on, the police compiled a detailed report piecing together fragments of information. They confiscated Stephen's computer and our home security footage, hoping to find any clues about his whereabouts. By evening, Harris concluded the initial investigation. We'll be in touch, he said, his tone grave. But remember, withholding information is a serious offense. The police left, the house returning to its eerie quiet. I was alone again, the weight of their investigation pressing down on me. Every lie, Every omission felt like a ticking bomb, ready to explode at any moment. I knew the truth would eventually catch up with me, and when it did, there would be no escape. An unexpected knock on the door startled me. It was Linda, an old friend I hadn't seen in years. She stood on the doorstep, her expression a mix of concern and determination. I heard about everything, she said quietly. I'm here to help. I invited her inside feeling a mix of relief and caution. Linda had always been trustworthy, but her sudden appearance raised questions. We sat in the living room, and she listened attentively as I recounted the events of the past week. I can't believe Stephen would do something like this, she said, shaking her head. And you're a fair partner, Richard. What a nightmare. Her sympathy seemed genuine, but I couldn't help but wonder why she had come back into my life now. Linda offered to stay with me reassuring me that I wasn't alone in this ordeal. Her presence was both a comfort and a source of suspicion. As the days passed, she helped with chores around the house and accompanied me to meetings with Detective Harris. One evening, as we sat in the kitchen, Linda's phone buzzed. She glanced at it quickly before putting it away. Just a work thing, she explained casually, but I noticed a flicker of unease in her eyes. Despite my suspicions, I appreciated Linda's support. She brought groceries, cooked meals, and even helped me draft a statement for the police. Her practical help eased some of the burden, but I couldn't shake the feeling that she was hiding something. One night, as we watched the news, a report came on about the investigation into Stephen's disappearance. Linda tensed beside me, her eyes fixed on the screen. They'll find him, she muttered under her breath. Her reaction struck me as odd. Do you know something? I asked quietly. Linda hesitated, then shook her head. No, I just, I want this nightmare to be over for you. But her evasive response only fueled my suspicions. Was Linda hiding information about Stephen? About Richard? I couldn't be sure, but I knew I couldn't trust anyone completely. As the days turned into weeks, Linda's visits became less frequent. She claimed work was keeping her busy, but I sensed there was more to it. The unanswered questions about her motives weighed heavily on my mind. One afternoon, I found Linda packing her car outside. I have to go, she said hurriedly, avoiding my gaze. Work needs me. Her departure was abrupt, 
leaving me with more questions than answers. Alone again, I couldn't shake the feeling that Linda had her own secrets, her own reasons for getting involved. Her sudden appearance and disappearance added to the tangled web of uncertainty that now defined my life. I watched her car disappear down the street, wondering if I would ever see her again. Linda had been an ally in a time of need, but her motives remained a mystery. As the investigation into Stephen's disappearance continued, I knew I had to be wary of everyone, even those who claimed to be helping. Desperation consumed me when I logged into our bank accounts. Stephen had emptied them, leaving me financially destitute. Panic gripped me as I realized the extent of his betrayal. Bills piled up, unpaid, and I had no means to cover them. I called our financial advisor, hoping for a lifeline. She confirmed the worst. Our savings were gone, investments liquidated. I was left with nothing but debts and uncertainty. Facing the reality of my situation, I applied for assistance programs and sought legal advice. Each step was a reminder of how isolated I had become. Friends and family offered sympathy, but little tangible help. The house felt emptier than ever, stripped of its warmth and security. I sold what I could, barely making a dent in the mounting bills. Each day brought new challenges, each bill another reminder of Stephen's betrayal. As I navigated the bureaucratic maze, I realized how alone I truly was. The financial ruin was a cruel twist, compounding the emotional turmoil. I had to rebuild my life from scratch, but the road ahead seemed impossibly steep. During a thorough search of the house, I stumbled upon a dusty, forgotten diary tucked away in the back of Stephen's office closet. Curiosity peaked, I flipped it open cautiously. The pages were filled with Stephen's handwriting, detailing events and emotions I had never known. The diary revealed a side of Stephen I hadn't seen before. His entries spoke of dreams deferred, frustrations buried beneath a facade of normalcy. He wrote of ambitions thwarted by circumstances beyond his control, of regrets that haunted him late into the night. As I read further, the entries took a darker turn. There were cryptic mentions of past indiscretions, hints at secrets he had kept hidden from me. My initial shock gave way to confusion and a sense of betrayal. How could I have been so blind to the turmoil simmering beneath the surface? The diary offered no clear answers, only fragments of a troubled soul wrestling with inner demons. I struggled to reconcile the man I thought I knew with the complex figure emerging from the pages. The more I read, the less I understood about the person I had married. Some entries were dated around the time of Richard's disappearance, adding another layer of suspicion. Stephen's words hinted at a brewing storm of resentment and anger, but they offered no conclusive evidence of his involvement in Richard's fate. Hours passed as I pored over the diary, piecing together fragments of Stephen's inner turmoil. It became clear that our marriage had been built on a foundation of half-truths and unspoken grievances. The revelations left me shaken, questioning everything I thought I knew. Closing the diary, I realized that its contents had irreversibly altered my perception of Stephen. He was no longer the steadfast husband I had believed him to be. The diary was a testament to the complexities of human nature, a stark reminder that behind closed doors, everyone harbors secrets. I tucked the diary into my bag, unsure of what to do next. The revelations it contained had deepened the mystery surrounding Stephen's disappearance and Richard's fate. As I navigated the uncertain terrain ahead, one thing was clear. I had to confront the truth, no matter how unsettling it might be. The morning after Detective Harris left, the first reporter appeared at my doorstep. Dressed in a press suit and holding a microphone, he introduced himself as Mike from the local news station. His questions were probing, relentless. Can you tell us about the disappearance of your husband and children? He asked, his voice insistent. I declined to comment, shutting the door firmly in his face. But that was just the beginning. The media frenzy intensified as reporters from other outlets joined in. They camped outside my house, cameras pointed, waiting for any sign of activity. Phone calls flooded in, reporters seeking interviews and exclusives. I disconnected my landline and turned off my cell phone, seeking refuge from the relentless barrage of inquiries. The constant scrutiny added to my stress and fear turning my life into a public spectacle. Every move I made was scrutinized, every word analyzed. Rumors spread like wildfire, 
fueled by speculation and half-truths. I felt like a prisoner in my own life, trapped by the relentless attention of strangers. One afternoon, a tabloid published a sensationalized story about Stephen's alleged double life. The headline screamed accusations, painting a portrait of deception and betrayal. I read the article in disbelief, wondering how they could twist the truth so drastically. Friends and family urged me to stay strong, offering support amidst the chaos. They shielded me from the worst of the media onslaught, but I knew I couldn't escape the spotlight entirely. Detective Harris warned me about the dangers of public attention. They'll twist everything, he said gravely. Don't let them manipulate you. His words echoed in my mind as I struggled to maintain composure amidst the storm of scrutiny. As days turned into weeks, the media circus showed no signs of abating. I avoided going out in public, fearing the intrusive questions and judgmental stares. The constant pressure took its toll, wearing down my defenses. One evening, I caught a glimpse of myself on the news. The reporter spoke of a desperate wife, a missing family, and unanswered questions. The image they portrayed bore little resemblance to the reality I knew. I retreated further into solitude, seeking refuge from the relentless attention. Behind closed doors, I tried to piece together fragments of my shattered life, grappling with the weight of uncertainty and the relentless scrutiny of the outside world. Just as the media frenzy reached its peak, Detective Harris called me urgently. He arrived with a grave expression, carrying a sealed evidence bag. We found this in Stephen's office, he said, handing me a crumpled letter. The letter was addressed to Richard, my affair partner. My heart raced as I read Stephen's words, I know about you and my wife. Meet me tonight, or I'll expose everything. The revelation hit me like a punch to the gut. Stephen had known about our affair all along, but why hadn't he confronted me directly? And what had happened when he met Richard that night? Detective Harris urged me to stay calm as he explained the implications. This changes everything, he said. We need to find Richard and question him immediately. With renewed determination, I joined the investigation, desperate for answers. We retraced Richard's last known movements, interviewing witnesses and analyzing phone records. Each lead brought us closer to uncovering the truth. One evening, we received a tip from a concerned neighbor. They had seen Richard's car parked near a remote cabin on the outskirts of town. Detective Harris wasted no time, mobilizing a team to investigate. As we approached the cabin, tension hung in the air. The door was ajar, the interior dimly lit. We entered cautiously, calling out Richard's name. The silence that greeted us was deafening. In the dim light, we found a clue that sent chills down my spine. A blood-stained shirt crumpled on the floor. The implications were clear. Richard had been here, but where was he now? Detective Harris radioed for backup, his voice tight with urgency. Secure the perimeter, he ordered, his eyes scanning the room for any sign of life. We searched every corner, hoping for a clue that would lead us to Richard and unravel the mystery once and for all. As the search intensified, fear gripped me. Had Richard been harmed? Was he involved in Stephen's disappearance? Or was he another victim in this tangled web of deceit? Hours passed as we combed through the cabin, piecing together fragments of evidence. The search yielded little, leaving us with more questions than answers. But one thing was certain. We were closer than ever to uncovering the truth. As dawn broke, Detective Harris made a grim discovery. A discarded phone, its screen cracked. He examined it carefully, searching for any recent activity. We need to trace this, he said his voice tight with determination. The tension that had simmered for weeks finally boiled over into a climactic confrontation. Detective Harris had gathered all the key players in the investigation. Myself, Linda, and a subdued man in handcuffs, Richard. In a stark interrogation room, Harris laid out the evidence methodically. We found your fingerprints on the murder weapon, he said, his tone firm. Richard remained silent, his eyes fixed on the table in front of him. Linda sat beside me, her expression unreadable. She had been elusive since her sudden reappearance, and now her involvement seemed more suspicious than ever. I watched her closely, wondering what secrets she still held. Harris turned to me, his gaze piercing. Do you recognize this? He asked, sliding a photograph across the table. It was a blurred image of a figure outside my house, 
taken the night of Stephen's disappearance. Is this you? I hesitated, my mind racing. The photograph was damning evidence, but I couldn't remember being outside that night. Linda's presence loomed large in my thoughts, her motives still unclear. Richard finally spoke, his voice hoarse. I didn't kill him, he insisted. Stephen was already dead when I found him. His words hung in the air, adding another layer of confusion to an already tangled web of deceit. Harris pressed on, his questions relentless. What were you doing at the cabin? He demanded. Richard's silence spoke volumes, but Harris refused to relent. We know you were there. What happened? Linda shifted uncomfortably beside me, her eyes darting between Richard and Harris. Her involvement in the events leading up to Stephen's disappearance remained a mystery, but her presence raised more questions than answers. As the interrogation stretched on, the truth began to emerge. Richard's story matched the evidence. Stephen had confronted him that night, leading to a struggle that ended in tragedy. But where did Linda fit into all of this? The final pieces of the puzzle fell into place, revealing a tangled web of deceit and betrayal. Linda's motives became clear as she recounted her role in the events leading up to Stephen's disappearance. In the end, the truth prevailed, but at a cost. The final confrontation had laid bare the lies and secrets that had haunted us all. As I left the police station that night, I couldn't help but wonder if justice had truly been served, or if the wounds left behind would ever truly heal. In the days following the climactic confrontation, the aftermath unfolded with a mix of closure and lingering uncertainty. Detective Harris concluded the investigation with a somber acknowledgement of the tragic events that had unfolded. Richard's confession, coupled with forensic evidence, provided a grim clarity to Stephen's disappearance. I sat through countless interviews with lawyers and reporters, each probing for answers and insights into the tangled web of deceit that had ensnared us all. The media frenzy had died down, replaced by a quieter, more introspective atmosphere. Linda had disappeared once again, leaving behind unanswered questions and a sense of unease. Her motives remained elusive, her role in the events that had transpired still shrouded in mystery. I wondered if I would ever truly understand her actions. Financial ruin loomed large in my mind. Stephen's betrayal had left me with debts and uncertainty about my future. With the help of legal counsel, I navigated the complex process of untangling our shared finances and securing my financial stability. Friends and family offered their support, their presence a steady anchor in the storm of emotions that threatened to overwhelm me. They helped me pack up the house, a painful reminder of the life I had once known. As I moved into a small apartment, I found solace in the quiet routine of daily life. Each day brought new challenges and opportunities to rebuild. I sought counseling to process the trauma of the past months, slowly coming to terms with the harsh realities I had faced. The legal proceedings dragged on, a reminder of the lingering consequences of my actions. I attended court hearings, facing Stephen's family and Richard's loved ones with a mixture of guilt and resignation. In the midst of it all, I found moments of clarity and hope. I enrolled in courses to upgrade my skills, determined to carve out a new path forward. The future remained uncertain, but I was resolute in my determination to rebuild my life from the shattered remnants of my past. The journey ahead was daunting, but with each small step, I found strength and resilience I never knew I possessed. The aftermath was a time of reflection and renewal, a chance to redefine myself and embrace the uncertain future with courage and hope.